Hey, welcome back, guys, to Outside the Lab, episode 14. Uh, sponsored here by Under Armour. Uh, we got Jason Burke with us today, head coach of Lander University. Um, it's a pleasure having you on, Burke. Excited to be here. Looking forward to it, man. Awesome, man. Awesome. Hey, I want to get right into it a little bit. He's been at Lander, uh, I guess, uh, is this is this just finished year four? You got year, year four. four? Yeah, awesome, year four. I'm getting man. older, man. <laughs> you got uh and then he was at uh, five years as a guy there started over at gardner webb uh you got his masters over at gardner webb uh worked out there with coach strap and uh and uh and Wofford, one of my good friends uh coach inter donato so man you've uh you've been around some good guys i have man i've been pretty fortunate to uh to work under all those guys and to learn from them and and to have you know have his mentors in france Right. Yeah, we, we, me and you just kind of started together in the coaching part of it. And uh, I want to get right into it. You, we were talking a little bit before the show about, um, you know, you kind of getting diving into the pitching part of how the body works and all that kind of stuff. Did that have a lot or did you – were you thinking about that as you were getting your uh, – because you got your master's <laughs> in sports science, and, sports science and pedagogy. Is that is that what kind of started it all, man? Yeah, I mean, you know, when I was at Gardner-Webb, I got my master's in that and – you know, I, I became a certified strength conditioning coach and, you know, I had no, <laughs> I had no interest in being a strength and conditioning coach. Um, but while I was doing that, I really kind of learned, you know, Hey, I can use this to become a better pitching coach, teach these guys how to throw harder. Um, you know, while I was doing that, I kind of, you know, makeshift came up with a formula to, to teach velocity, if that's what you want to call it. And, um, <clears throat> you know, man, I thought I learned a ton doing that. And then I was fortunate enough that coach strap, you know, he paid for me to go down and learn from some guys, man. He paid for me to go down to Florida and train with a couple of different guys and, um, you know, just kind of pick their brain at the Florida Baseball Ranch with Randy Sullivan. Um, you know, he's been great. I've learned a lot from him um, to go down to um, – I was trying to think of the place that me and Dusty went down to in uh, Pensacola, Florida, um, and learned from a guy named Russ, um, who's now their director of player development down there. And, um, you know, man, learned a ton from Russ as well. Um, you know, just, just been around some really, really smart guys. And, you know, like, like most coaches, you know, most of my stuff is not my own, you know, I stole it from someone else and, um, you know, was fortunate enough to kind of, again, just, just glob it together. Um, you know, and I still have injuries just like every other pitching coach or head coach. I'm not trying to act like I don't, but, um, you know, I do feel like we've got a pretty good formula now to, to teach velocity and try to keep these guys healthy while we do it. Yeah. I, uh, I, I I definitely uh, like I said, man. You were one of the first ones to start talking about that stuff and 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 kind of going from there. And, and you know, you've had several guys, um, you know, to develop, like you said, develop into some some pretty damn good arms uh, and, and being drafted and, and working their way up pro ball. Um, tell me about you know, in, in general, just you know, uh, is the program that you do for, for, for the group? Is it for individual kind of, what do you go through as far as that? Yeah, it's, it's kind of for the group. I mean, you know, everything's individual based, but it's, you know, basically I assess their body movement. So, you know, mobility, flexibility of different parts of their body, um, you know, range of motion in their upper body with their scaps and their shoulder and external internal rotation. I mean, really what I do is track those, and try to track those as best I can. And I was really, really diligent about that at Walford and at Lander. I don't do it quite as much, to be honest with you. And I've dove more into the movement patterns. Um, you know, the, the general gist of the formula is, is this, you know, I believe three things produce velocity. Um, number one, I think momentum produces velocity. Number two, I think rotational power produces velocity. And number three is sequencing. And I basically break my guys up into one of those three categories. So it's, you know, hey, this guy needs to work more, more on momentum. This guy needs to work more on rotational power. This guy needs to work more on sequencing. So, like, the general overview of it is that. And, and the way I explain it to people, you know, whether it's this podcast or whether it's me talking to a recruit is, hey, man, if I was going to give you $100 to throw this baseball 90 miles per hour right now, what would you do? And the answer is the same for every guy. It's I would get some type of crow hop, run and start. I would, you know, run and gun it or whatever. I would try to rotate hard as hell, and I would try to sequence my delivery as best I could, you know, just like a power clean. Like I would, you know, pull from the ground, create momentum. I would try to sequence the movement 
um, you know, the best I can, you know, to, to get it there. And obviously there's no rotational power involved in that, but they're trying to produce momentum or power and they're trying to sequence it in the power clean. The only difference in pitching is now all of a sudden I've got rotation involved as well. Um, you know, so again, I just find the leak. And, you know, once we find the leak, then we coach the leak. So like, you know, the best way I can describe it is, you know, if we did a running gun and, and your running gun, Aaron, was 100 miles per hour, but off the mound, you were only 90, I would think you would have a momentum leak. So then I would coach you in momentum on the mound. So like we wouldn't do more running guns. You know, there's no reason to. You're already good at that. Like that would make no sense whatsoever. Um, you know, what we would do is we would try to increase your momentum on the mound to get that arm strength you already have and arm speed you already have to translate into the bullpen and into the game. Right. Well, go back to sequencing a little bit. Is that just uh, in in your in your words? Is that getting your body in the right positioning? Like, what what kind of break that down just a little yeah. bit for our viewers? Absolutely, man. So, like, you know, I believe everything starts with the back foot. Um, you know, I believe everything starts with the foundation. If you jack the back foot up, you don't get it right. <clears throat> back leg, however you want to think about it. Um, you know, I don't think your sequencing is going to be very good at all. And really all sequencing is, is getting your body in the right positions to produce power. <clears throat> so what I'm trying to do is put force into the ground, okay? And then I'm trying to hold that force in the ground as long as I can hold it while moving forward, which sounds crazy and sounds very hard, and it is. Um, <clears throat> you know, I look for certain things in the delivery um, to see if guys have that. And when I'm recruiting, I hate to say I don't care if you have that or not, but I, but I don't. You know, the more leaks I see, the harder you could throw, right? So, like, if I see you at 85 and I'm like, you know, man, I can get this kid that's throwing 88, 89 already, or I can get this kid that's throwing 84, 85. If the 84, 85 has more leaks than the 88, 89, you know, in my, in my jacked-up development mind, I'm probably more likely to take the 84, 85 because I think I could help turn him into 95, whereas the 88, 89, I maybe only can help get to 90 or 91. Um, you know, so, you know, sequencing to me, you know, again, is all about starting off with a good foundation, and that, that's the back leg. Um, and obviously we can talk more about that if you want as well. Um, you know, but that, that to me is where sequencing starts, and then it's figuring out is it a sequencing problem from an athleticism standpoint, to where, you know, I just need to teach this kid and let him feel it? Or is or like you talked about the body, is it something restricting it? You know, is there a lack of mobility? Is there a lack of flexibility? Um, you know, is there a lack of strength? You know, is this kid a, you know, 160-pound freshman that doesn't have the core strength or leg strength to actually make this happen? Um, you know, so that's that would be where I would start with that stuff. Yeah, I love that part, man. And, and I think that's why there, there's so many people – uh, you know, whether it's mid-major D1 down to Division II, NAI, whatever it is, that people are wondering why, like, you know, on Friday nights and Saturday nights, man, in, in Division two, like, there's dudes. Like, mm -hmm. there's dudes. And people are like, well, how in the hell did he get here throwing 90-93? Well, you just explained it, my man. And that's exactly what I think a big part of it is. And I like to see are the guys that are, so you know, so-called raw. Oh man, because this guys are kind of and uh, Robert, I lost you there for just a second. Yeah, I mean, I, those are the kind of guys I like because the, the so called raw guys and and they have some athleticism and and fast twitch, man, those guys make huge jumps. That's why they end up at Division huge. Two. And you wonder why huge jumps, man. We do. We played North Greenville in a midweek game. You know, this year, and I bet there's 20, 25 scouts there. Um, you know, I had a big lefty going that was super athletic, that throws really hard. Um, they had a couple of different righties. They kind of Johnny Hole staffed it, but they had a couple of different righties that were, you know, anywhere from 89 to 93. And, um, you know, man, like one of my buddies that played with me in college came to the game and, you know, he walked down to the dugout in between innings and he was like, yo, man, I think every MLB team's here. And just started, you know, joking around laughing. And I was like, yeah, man, like that's what – you know, some people don't understand is, you know, you show up to the right Division Two game on the right night, and it's it's impressive, man. I mean, you, you go watch Catawba play. Um, yeah. You know, you go watch North Greenville play. Um, you know, and I'm not trying to leave anybody out, but those are two that popped in my head extremely quick. You know, man, it's it's a different level of baseball, man. It's not, 
you know, man, I had to go play Division Two ball, man. You're lucky to be on that roster. You're lucky to be on that team. And if you're starting for them, man, you're dang sure lucky to be in the lineup. Yeah, some some darn good programs for sure. And, and uh, you know, I just remember uh, a few years back when I think it may have been your first year, we, how we head down to Lander from Mars Hill. And, I mean, you guys had some dudes on the mound. I mean, it's like, what the hell? And, and talk a little bit about the, you know, you're talking about, you know, a couple teams – but you guys, as far as in the Peach Belt, are probably in one or the top two Division two conferences in the country. Yeah, I mean, that – you know, the league's just so good and it's so deep. Um, you know, you – you know, last year, you know, we, we, had, we had an off year, man. We had a lot of talent. We had a lot of dudes that were kind of worried about themselves, not worried about the team. And, um, you know, I had a hard time getting, getting them to all play together. And that was why losing this season – not to downplay the coronavirus, but losing this season was kind of kind of devastating to some of our guys because we had we had turned that page, man. We were playing as a team, you know. We were thirteen and eight, and you know, out of those eight losses, excuse me, you know, we dude, we we lost I think five of those games in the seventh inning or later. I mean, we easily could have been, you know, seventeen and four or eighteen and three, um, you know. But to get back to answer your question, man, it was so deep. You know, dude, we finished ninth in the league and missed the conference tournament by one game. And my ace was a 16th rounder. <laughs> so, like, you yep. know, if we would have been in that tournament, nobody would have wanted to face my guy on Friday night. Um, right. You know, my closer was a 23rd rounder. Um, you know, so, like, it was just, you know, this the league was so deep and is so deep every year, man. I mean, you're going to run into some, some guys, no matter who you're playing, especially in that league. And, you know, the reason I say it that way, you know, for people listening to this that don't know recruiting that well, you know, man, I call it the triangle. <clears throat> you know, the peach belt is – it gets a, it gets the triangle. So, you know, what happens is you get really good high school kids. You get junior college kids that couldn't go Division One for academics and can go Division Two, And then you get the Division One kickbacks. And you put that in the area where the peach belt's located, and it's right on top of the SOCON. It's right on top of the ASUN. It's right on top of the Big South. It's right on top of the SEC and right on top of the ACC. And you got other conferences like the Colonial that kind of kick in that triangle as well. And where do those kids want to go when they leave Division I? They want to go to the Peach Belt. And why do they want to go to the Peach Belt? Nice stadiums and really good schools, man. So it, you know, it, it, makes, it makes sense. And, you know, I'm not saying that every one of them land in the Peach Belt because obviously they can't. Um, but that, that's why I think the Peach Belt is such a good league. Yeah, and the weather doesn't hurt at all, you know. No, <laughs> um, it's it's and, and you know East Cobb's right there too, man. You know. Yep. Yep. So speaking of East Cobb, th this interview, man, is like day one. All right, of East Cobb, you're going down. You got all your pitching matchups that you're going <laughs> to see. All right, this ain't like day six. All right, yeah. when you're just grinding. Dude, you know what I mean? <laughs> day one stuff. Yeah, I love it. I love it, man. This is getting up at 4 30 in the morning, getting your damn car and driving down and getting ready for 18 hours of baseball that day. That's what we're talking about. Yo, I love it, dude. And I tell you what, man, me and you could reminisce about this all day long. But like the younger coaches now, I tell this story and you're gonna laugh and you're gonna start telling if you hadn't already. Dude, me and you used to go down to East Cobb with a freaking paper map. There was no GPS. Um, That's right. You know, I remember when that one coach, I think he was at Piedmont when he made it, he literally made a map and started <laughs> selling it. It had like a grid on the back of it for how far it took to get to each high school. Um, you know, and he started selling the dang thing to make money. <laughs> yeah, I had one. I, I had one, absolutely. Somewhere. That's exactly right. Well, this, yeah. <laughs> then uh, what uh, – let's get back a little bit, uh, Berkey, on – uh, the recruiting part of it, um, you know, and now you being a head coach, you're still, you know, obviously, uh, in and, and talk uh, a little bit, you know, maybe not the East Cobb days, so to speak, but the recruiting part. What what are you looking for? You know what I mean? Just in in general, uh, to to kind of make. Your yeah, I mean, you know. For me, Robert, I'll start on the position player side, man. Um, you know, I think, you know, when I'm looking for a position player now as opposed to a couple of years ago, I'm looking for somebody that understands the game. I'm looking for somebody that, you know, doesn't necessarily have to be taught 
things, you know, that go with the game, like a third baseman that, you know, understands, hey, man, there's two strikes now. I can back up and cover as much range as I want because this kid's not going to bunt anymore. Um, you know, the guy that understands the cut system, the guy that understands where to play depth-wise. You know, and, and the reason that I'm looking for that now as opposed to just raw skills or raw tools is the deeper I've got into being a head coach, pitching coach, you know, I still call the game. I still, you know, work with our pitchers all the time. And, you know, man, having guys who have that in-game feel helps out tremendously. And, and, again, you did it, man. You were a head coach and a pitching coach at the same time too. And, you know, man, when I'm trying to call pitches and, you know, make sure first and third plays are right and, you know, make sure guys are all in the same position, you know, as far as the positioning of where we want to be, Dude, it, it, it's really hard not to make mistakes. You know, I make tons of mistakes calling a game. You know, I joke around with offensive guys all the time about how easy their job is. You know, they coach third base and they make, you know, 10 decisions a game. You know, I make 150 a game calling pitches. Yeah. Um, you know, and you were the same, re- same way. So, like, you know, having that in-game feel to me is, is huge, man, because I think, you know, my staff and I are really, really good at teaching the tools. We're really, really good at teaching the velocity or – or the swing, um, you know, or an approach. Uh, but, but it's hard to teach in-game feel to an 18- to 22-year-old. And it's even harder when he's not getting in-game reps consistently. Um, you know, you're sitting there, you know, how many kids nowadays want to stand beside a coach the entire game pretty much knowing they're not going to play and watch a shortstop and watch how he moves himself around with the count and who's on the mound? You know, how many – 18 to 22 year olds that know they're probably not going to go in want to sit there and watch the third baseman, you know, do what I was talking about earlier. Okay. There's two strikes. I'm going to back up and give myself, you know, as much range as I can cover with my arm. Um, You know, how many guys want to have the field to charge in on a bunt, you know, play the bunt as a third baseman, know that you don't have the guy first full arm fake and look for the, look for the guy third. You know, I just don't think, especially nowadays, you know, I don't think guys really want to sit in the dugout and learn that. So, like, if you can find that on the recruiting trail, I think it's huge. And, again, I used to be the polar opposite. I want to be, you know, flashy 60 time and a flashy arm across the infield. And, um, you know, the guy that could have the exit velos at 95 miles per hour. Um, you know, I think I think the days of me looking for that are, are, are gone, man. I think they're over. I don't think that matters nearly as much because I think I'm recruiting something that we can teach. Um on the pitching side of things, we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, but I'm looking for certain checkpoints. Most importantly, I'm looking for leaks that I think I can coach to get more velocity. And I'm not talking the generic, hey, man, let's get bigger and stronger and you're going to throw harder. You know, my running joke, I have a 10-year-old son, and he likes to hit way more than he likes to throw, full disclosure. Um, but, like, if he was getting recruited as a pitching as a pitcher and the pitching coach was like, hey, man – you know, we're going to bring you here and, you know, we're going to get you bigger and stronger and you're going to throw harder. And that was it for his sale of how to teach velocity or how to develop my son. I'd, I'd get up and leave. Um, you know, that that's, you know, not shit. You know, yeah, like if we get bigger and stronger, we're going to throw harder. Like, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's great, man. Yeah. Um, you know, I want to hear somebody talk about, you know, how they're going to keep him healthy. I want to hear somebody talk about their arm care program. I want to hear somebody talk about, you know, their throwing program. I want to hear somebody talk about flexibility and mobility and, you know, how we're going to use the ground to create energy. And, you know, I want that stuff to, to be ever evolving. You know, I want that stuff to be something where, you know, if, if what I know now shouldn't be what I know in development five years down the road, because I should be studying and learning, um, you know, and, and I like data and I like all that stuff, but, you know, I, I don't think it's for everybody. You know, I mean, we have a rap soto and we have spin rates and vertical breaks and, you know, we can chat about that if you want to. But, again, I don't think that stuff's for everybody, man. Um, you know, so that that's what I look for pitching-wise is someone that's developmental, someone that wants to learn, someone that wants to be in an environment like I'm talking about, you know, where – we're going to develop the crap out of your movements and let your natural athleticism and why we recruited you take over when the time is right. Yeah. And, and let's go back to end game feel a little bit and, and what, you know, what that term used to mean. And, and I agree with you a lot is, is when we first started trying to find the coach's son, because he has all that. So your high school coach uh, or a high school coach, his son, that's the guy you want to recruit because he had all that kind of stuff in-game feel, but that 
that contributor in, he's going to play his ass off. You know what yeah. I mean? He's going to play hard. He's yes. going to know what the game's going on. And you're right. I think the last couple of years is what when I realized and, and got back to, hey, you know, it's not all about these numbers. It's all not all about this. We can teach some of that. It, yeah. It's more of how you're going to show up and play every day and what we're going to get out of you. Yeah, and, I, and I'll give a great example, man. We have a really talented shortstop here that we got from a junior college. And he started off the year starting at shortstop. He ended up hurting his knee, I think it was four or five games into the season. And when that happened, I had a backup shortstop who we love a lot. True freshman, um, he's that, man. He's a gamer. He is baseball savvy, you know, coach's type son. He's not a coach's son, but that's the way he yeah. thinks. And I go back to one play he made during the fall where I was like, yeah, this kid's got it. Um, you know, we had a transfer from an SEC school at third base. We had him at shortstop during the inner squad. There's runners on first and second. I think there was one out. Um, there was a ball hitting the six hole and it wasn't hit very hard. And the third baseman starts going after the ball and Matthew, the freshman starts going after the ball. And as soon as he takes off the shortstop, he knows he can get to it. Okay. And he knows I, I can get this ball, but I can't throw it all the way across the diamond to get this out. He yells at the third baseman, no, 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 bag, bag, bag. Like telling the junior transfer from an SEC school, don't go after this. Go cover third base and we're going to get an out. Third baseman retreats, he picks up the ball, throws a dude out of third base. And I remember looking at that like, that's hard to teach. You know, that, that's hard to coach up. And I'm going to make the point after this inner squad of how important that play is but I don't know that any other guy on my team necessarily would have the feel in game, in the moment, to do that and grab that ball and know immediate, or before he even grabs the ball, know that I've got to go to third base. I think a lot of them would have tried to make the Derek Jeter play. Yeah. You know, they would have tried to field it and throw it across, or they would have let the third baseman try to take it and see if he can make the play at first. Um, you know, but he had the feel at an, as an 18 year old coming into there you know, to yell, no, 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 bag, 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 and get the out of third base. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when you bring that stuff up after the inner squad, uh, your team was, was probably a little bit better than mine. Hell, half the guys don't know what you're talking about when you when, – when you, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. what are you talking about right here, you know? I mean, I tell my team, and, and I, would, I would say this is true for any coach at any level. Okay, I don't care if it's Little League or if you're the freaking – you're, you know, Coach Avon at NC State, man. I don't care. I think, I think it's true at any level. After a game or inner squad, your team's just got done warming up, playing a game, possibly lifting in the morning. I mean, you know, you know what, it, you know what goes down, man. Early work, everything. I tell my guys all the time. I fully expect about twenty five percent of you guys to really be locked in and listening. Yeah. I'm yeah. Just, and, and and it's not a fault of theirs. Like I'm not yeah. blaming them. It's just the facts of the situation, man. I mean, you're talking a three-hour inter-squad practice. You're talking early work before to get loose. You're talking possibly lifting weights already. You're talking maybe having to lift weights after. Like, their mind's already going to that. Like, dang, I'm tired as crap, and I got to go in there and lift for an hour? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you understand it, Remy. And some of, these, some of these players that haven't experienced it maybe don't understand it yet. But after an inter-squad is really not the best time to be going over notes. Right. You know, it's just not because – it's hard to lock in, man. I mean, you know, imagine me and you going for a run, then lifting weights. Um, you know, we're tired as crap, and then we're trying to sit down and learn. It's right. hard. It's hard, right. man. Yeah, I remember doing that back in 04. I, I can't say I've done much of that since, but uh, I remember uh, lifting and running in 04. <laughs> <laughs> hey, speaking of, what do you think about my attire, man? I'm representing Division Two baseball. We're always playing in the winter. All right, so the season should be winter instead of spring. So I got this on just for you, not because I just moved into a house that's 113 years old and <laughs> it was 35 degrees last night, and whatever it is outside, it's five degrees cooler inside. That's not why I'm doing it. That's not, <laughs> right? that's not why I'm doing it. <laughs> I love it, man. And every Division II coach in the South has got long sleeves. So it's, yeah. it's May whatever now, man. I'm wearing long sleeves doing this inside too, mostly because that's what I have more of. <laughs> hey, I love it. Hey, I'll tell you, I'll tell you when a division two season gets done. All right. It's when it starts warming up. That's when you get done. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, dude, we would have, I joked around the other day on Mother's Day. That would have been our conference championship day for the tournament. Um, right. You know, I joked around with my wife and I was like, hey, like, you know, I would either be playing a game today and be extremely happy 
or I'd be super upset that we were our season was already over and we got eliminated. So, so this is the only way you could have me home and be happy. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Hey, let's go back in, and and, and you're talking about the, the the kids being locked in, talking meetings in general about certain things. That's why it, you know over here at Athletes Lab, um, you know I really make whenever I'm whenever I'm talking with with kids and their parents are around, I really make a concerted effort for the parents to hear what I'm saying because you know I won't the best chance for whatever I'm given, whatever kind of info, whether it's, you know, on pitching or infield or, or just, you know, the season itself, how to get recruited. So there's a better chance for kids to kind of get it from both ways. You know what I mean? As yep. far as the communication and hopefully it sinks in and it's about the education part of it. And I think that's why it's so good to have, um, you know, team captains or guys that you can kind of rely on and, and also assistants that can kind of maybe, um, tell it a different way. Yeah, I agree, man. I think, you know, hearing different perspective perspectives is, is huge to me, dude. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, I'll put it in a pitching round because obviously that's what I've done my whole, my whole career. You know, I, I put it like this, man. I don't have any issue with guys going home and working with a different pitching guy. Um, whereas I think some pitching coaches do, I think they, you know, only want it done their way. And, you know, they, they, you know, they want it, you know, hey, man, I'm your guy and I'm your only guy. Um, you know, I think hearing stuff in a different way, man, is is huge, dude. I think it helps guys learn. I think it helps them grow. Um, you know, I speak to my team in the outfield after every game, and it's very, very short. I think every one of my guys would, would, would agree with that, even though I get long-winded sometimes. Um, you know, now when I speak to them after they've cleaned up the field in the dugout, all the parents are standing right on top of the dugout. I mean, they're just standing there waiting on their son, listening to it. Um, and I do that on purpose. Um, you know, I speak in front of the parents on purpose because I want them to hear what my message is, whether it was a win or whether it was a loss. And I want them to hear how I'm talking to their son, how I'm developing their son as a human being, as a person, as a father, um, you know, as a husband. You know, I just think there's so much to be learned from all of it, dude. I think perspective is huge. And I think perception is even bigger. Um, you know, I think, I think perception is reality, man. If you perceive me as, as being something, then that's your reality of who I am. And, you know, when, when we look at what we do for a living, you know, whether it's me or you, this, this doesn't matter. We're really trying to help someone make life decisions and choices that sets them up to be a better person and, and to be able to serve their family, their community, um, you know, if they're lucky enough to, to be in charge of people and, you know, be a coach or be a teacher or, you know, you know, you want them to be good at it. You want them to be able to lead guys and help guys. And, you know, man, to me, you know, that's what it's all about. Um, you know, developing relationships with my guys, being able to coach them up, um, you know, not only in baseball, but in life and having a relationship when it's all all said and done. And, um, you know, that that would be what I would tell any parent or any guy or any person going through the recruiting process is, you know, Hey man, it's cool to walk down the hall and say, Hey, I'm committed to this SEC, ACC school. It's even cooler to be 25 years old and have a relationship with your coach. Um, you know, that's lasting a lifetime. Um, and I'm not saying you can't get those at an ACC or SEC school that people get those all the time, man. Um, but I would search for the relationship and the education you want maybe more than just the experience of wearing wearing a t-shirt with a logo. Yeah, it is the relationships that matter for sure. And that's what you know Grant Grant has has done with with Athletes Lab and, and make a concerted effort and and really reach out to the highest and same guys. Um we, we want them to come in. We want them to come in the facility. We want you in the facility. Uh you know, we you know we we're going to bring in guys um, and because we can all learn from each other. And so I don't think it's, you know, who's who's doing the best job or, hey, it's me or, hey, it's this coach. I, it's all of us have a part in it. And uh, it really doesn't matter who has the biggest part or smallest part. We all have a part about um, shaping these kids. And, and hopefully they're going to make the, the right decisions. And But we can set them up. Uh, you know, with our experiences and with our relationship. And, and hopefully when they have to make those tough choices, you know, they make the right one. And, and that's all you can ask. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, with what you guys are doing there, Aaron, I think to have you, to have Grant, um, you know, two guys that I know personally, two guys that have coached and played at different levels. Um, man, I think you guys are unique in the aspect of, you know, not only what you're doing and what you're teaching, but the experiences you guys have with with coaching at Division One, playing at Division One, um, you know, being an All-American, um, you know, being a head coach, being a pitching coach, seeing what the budgets look like at these different schools, seeing what the experience looks like on the bus and in the hotel. And, um, you know, man, I just think that makes you guys very unique. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what – Let's go back to um, rosters a little bit, uh, Bert. Um, let's go back to rosters a little bit as far as it, what, what we're trying to do. I know this; everybody's getting their year backs, kind of mess some things up. It, is that? Do you look at that as a positive? Um, hell, we both got our dogs in here. I love it. Um, <laughs> but are, do you look at that as a positive or a negative? Like, what are you guys trying to do to 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 with that landscape? Yeah, I mean, I you know, Remy, I look at it as a positive, man. Um, you know, I think anything in life, man, you can either turn it into a positive or turn it into a negative. And, you know, I think with this situation, you know, and everybody getting a year back, does it put more strain on the college coaches? Absolutely it does, man. Um, you know, you're talking, you know, I'm going to have to have conversations with every single guy on my roster about, hey, man, do we want to treat you as a sophomore or treat you as a freshman? We want to treat you as a junior or we want to treat you as a sophomore? Um, you know, me and my staff have got to make those decisions and, you know, we've also got to talk to the kids about it, um, you know, because once they graduate, I mean, it's free reign. I mean, they could transfer to Division One, not have to sit out a year and, you know, and so forth, man. Um, with the seniors being able to come back, I think it's really, you know, again, I think it's a positive, but I think it's how do you want to treat it? Um, you know, we were, you know, we were fortunate enough to where I had a little bit of scholarship money left over that I was saving for a transfer or for a junior college guy to bring in. Um you know, but now all of a sudden, obviously, I use that to bring back my seniors. Um, and it was, really, you know, it's really weird, man. You're re-offering guys that, that are on your roster, but you're calling them up and saying, hey, man, you were on X. But, like, I don't have X because I'd already spent it on this next class. You know, how about why? Um, you know, and it's really weird to do that. Um, you know, but but I, I look at it a huge positive, man. These guys get to come back. They get to have an impact for one more year. Um, you know, my team captain was a senior, so he gets to come back and be a team captain for a full year as opposed to just 21 games. Um, you know, I get to bring back some some good players, but, you know, even more so than that, some hard workers and some good people. And, you know, I think they can impact the group even more by giving them that year back. Was it Did it make it harder on us as college coaches? Absolutely it did, man. Um, I make no bones about that, man. It made it harder. You had to make some crazy decisions. Um, and I'm still making them right now to try to get this roster to where I want it to be. Um, but man, I think it, I think overall it'll it'll definitely be a positive. And conditioning part, we got in a, in our facility. We got a huge weight room. It's a college weight room. We got all the gadgets, all that stuff. We we got a couple uh, Alder and Ryan, uh, a couple of our uh, strength conditioning people. Uh, they do a fantastic job. Um, you know, a, a lot of this wasn't available to us when we were – obviously when we were going through this. You know, I graduated high school at 168 pounds, man. You know, what if I would have graduated at, 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 at you know, 190 or 200 and, and had a change up instead of just a fastball breaking ball or, you know, uh, you know, knew my mechanics were shot a little bit. You know what I mean as far yeah. as some of the stuff. Um, what, uh, you know, as far as – you know, I think our our age group goes through 2022 um, with, with with our guys. What do you tell a a 14, uh, a 15, or a 16 year old kid that is kind of average right now? You know what I mean? Like most of us. How yeah. how, how can what, what 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 would they do the next year or so, two years, three years, um, to to kind of get themselves uh, out there and 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 developed a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think it's all about setting up a routine. And, you know, I tell our guys all the time, the best players I've ever coached, they had a routine. And, you know, maybe their routine was, uh, you know, a notebook full. Maybe their routine was one sheet of paper full. Um, you know, but they had a routine, man. They had, I'm going to get in the weight room at X time. I'm going to do my extra work at X time. I'm going to do 
extra warm up at this time. Um, you know, and I think, you know, developing that routine has to be based off what you need to get better at. So if I'm an average 15 to 16 year old, you know, I'm probably talking, you know, I've got some, I'm not that fast. I'm not, you know, I don't have the arm strength. I don't have the bat speed. You know, I would start off with the body. I would start off with the body and I would start off with, man, I got to get me a really good warm up routine to get my body prepped and tuned to lift weights, to do speed training, to do my throwing properly. I would get an assessment. You know, that'd be the first thing I would do is, you know, I'd get an assessment. You can get one for probably as cheap as 40, 50 bucks, or you can spend $500 on it. Um, but I would get a body assessment. You know, how do my hamstrings work? Are they super flexible? Are they super mobile? Are they weak? Um, you know, how are my quads? How are my hip flexors? Um, you know, how is my back? How are my scap strengthening, my shoulder strengthening? You know, and I think, you know, getting that assessment to me would be the first thing. Um, and I think at 15 to 16 years old, you need to get that. Um, you know, as far as the next step, the next step would be getting me a good strength and conditioning program um, written by somebody that, that knows what they're doing and understands baseball and the demands on your body. Um, you know, after that, if I need speed, it would be the same thing for a speed program. You know, why am I slow? Do I have a, you know, a bad running form? Do I have, you know, a short stride? Or am I overstriding? Um, you know, I can get with somebody that can help me with strength wise in my hamstrings and, you know, in my quads. And, you know, maybe it's a little bit of my start form. Maybe I'm, you know, need some quickness and agility, or maybe it's just a, again, a flexibility mobility issue. Um, you know, and the next thing I would do is get the actual sports specific stuff. You know, I would get my throwing program. I would get my hitting, um, you know, whether you want to call it a program, if that's what you want to call it, it's fine. Um, you know, but I would get a routine established in that, you know, well, how am I going to make my exit velo better? How am I going to make my ability to catch the barrel better? How am I going to make my fastball better? How am I going to develop a changeup? Um, you know, failure can be the best guide in the world in baseball. Um, you know, if you throw crappy changeups for two weeks, that's fine. As long as you're learning why it's a crappy changeup. Um, you know, I tell my guys all the time, failure doesn't mean, doesn't have to be bad. Failure can be really, really, really freaking good. Because when you fail, I think the best figure out why they fail. Okay. And then they figure out how to fix it. I think the bad ones blame someone else. You know, they fail, and it's the coach's fault for giving me the crappy grip. They fail, and the drill stinks. Well, well you know what, man? A human being made that drill. <laughs> like, like yeah. I make up drills in the outfield all the time, and my guys at first are like, man, Coach Burke's crazy. He just made up this drill. Well, yeah, man, somebody made up that balance drill, you know, 50 years ago. Like, why, not, why, why can't I make up a drill? You yeah. know, so, like, to me, you know, I think guys that are willing to explore and willing to fail, you know, they're usually the best. So what you're saying, all right, what you're saying is, you know, we have all that stuff at Athletes Lab, so get your ass there is what you're saying. All right, Burke, a I like absolutely, it, man. my man, absolutely. Remy, give me a 10-second break to get this away from that, my dude. All right. Man. We're, on We're on the same page. I love it. Love it. So <clears throat> good stuff. The uh, Go back to the, uh, the uh, failure part of it. Failure part of it. I, I told a kid this the other day. He's 14 years old. Garbage change up. Okay. All right. Uh, fastball is okay. All right. I said, dude, this summer, throw your change up. Every time you throw, all right, if you throw 50 pitches, let's throw 20 of them change ups in a game. I said, who cares? What's going to happen? Nobody cares. But what's going to happen by the end of the summer after six tournaments? You're probably going to develop a change up. And guess what? By the time you're a freshman, sophomore, and junior in high school, you're going to have an above average change up that play, you know? Yep. And it's the truth, man. I think so many times as a coach, as a player, you know, we're scared to fail, man. Um, you know, we're scared parents. to fail. Parents and, are scared. Parents. Yeah, scared. Parents are, are scared to death to fail. And, you know, I think getting past that as a coach, as a player, as a parent, I think is vital, man. Um, you know, I use the story of I coached a kid who's in the big leagues now named Emilio Pagan. Yeah. And, you know, I use the story all the time of when, you know, Emilio had never touched a weighted ball in his life. He was starting to kind of dabble in him a little bit. I think he was a double A at this point. He's a double A all-star. And, you know, he wanted to learn the driveline drills and he was learning them on his own pretty much. And, 
you know, then he wanted to drive down to Lander to see what I knew about. I think it was my first year at Lander. I'm almost positive it was. And I remember kind of telling him, like, hey, man, you're a double-A all-star, dude. Like, I don't know if starting weighted balls now is the right thing. Like, Emilio, yeah, I use them now when I didn't use them when I coached you at Gardner-Webb. But, like, you know, I don't use them for every guy. Like, I don't think it's a one-size-fits-all type thing. You know, and Emilio, I mean, you know, you're a double-A all-star already, man. Like, I don't know that you need to dabble right now. And his exact answer back was, Coach, I didn't get in this to be a double-A player. I got in this to be a big leader. And if I get hurt doing this, I'm okay with that because I'm trying to make it to the show. And the dude had 20, I think it was 21 big league saves last year. Right. Um, you know, and part of the reason he had 21 saves has nothing to do with weighted balls, in my opinion. It has to do with the fact that he was okay with failure, man. He was okay with trying something in his mechanics and falling down in front of 10 peers on the ground and getting back up and trying it again. You know, he was okay with throwing the fastball up and somebody just torching it to learn that it didn't work. He would, you know, you know and, and he throws fastballs up all the time. So I'm just making up something right there. But like, you know, you got to find out the why. And to me, you know, as a coach, the best way you can coach someone is to tell them what to do, tell them why to do it, and then show them how to do it. And, you know, if you follow those three steps with everything you're doing, whether you're a parent, coach, whatever, you're probably going to have really good results, man. Right. Um, you know, but you can't be scared to fail with those three things, man. You can't be scared to fail with, you know, hey, man, you need to create more momentum in your delivery. Let's try this drill. And, you know, 10, 15, 20 reps or five days into it, you're like, man, that drill stinks. Like, it's not helping you at all. Like, to me, that's failing as a coach. But that's great. I learned. I learned from it, man. The kid learned from it. You know, the kids that don't get better are the kids that are like, man, I just wasted five days of development. That's their mentality after it. You know, I could have been getting better. No, nah, I mean, you got better, dude. Like, you learned that didn't work for you. Um, you know, you got a lot better. Yeah, absolutely. You, you got you to gotta keep experimenting. You got to keep trying things. Um, you got to have that base that you fall back on, what you were talking about earlier, um, with the three things you like, momentum, rotational power, sequence, and all that kind of stuff. You got to have a base. But you gotta you gotta be willing to 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 to, to try different things and, and, and go forward. I, I like that stuff a lot, uh, and we, we harp on that a lot as well. Um, one other thing, as far as um, the the kind of the progression before we before we get off here, you know, you know, when's the last time you know this summer when you go out recruiting when your guys go out recruiting, uh, you know, when when is the question gonna come up? Hey, were you in eighth grade or ninth grade All American? Uh, you trip perfect game guy. I mean, when, when is that going to come up? Is it? <laughs> it's, it's never going to come up, man. Um, you know, I think a lot of times kids and parents get caught up in the trap of if I don't play for this 13 U team, then I'm not going to make the high school team. And if I don't play for this 13 U team, I'm not going to be on this travel team when I'm older and it matters. And you know, baseball is just such a finicky recruiting. It's not watching film like football. It's not 40 times and bench presses. You know, every coach is looking for something different. And, you know, I tell guys all the time in the recruiting process, I'm like, man, you need to be valued. And, you know, your value has to do with whether you match up with what that college actually does. You know, if you're a kid and you have a – you're very fast twitch and you can steal bags and you can run – um, you know, I'm not saying you have to do that to play at Walford College. I'm not saying that, but Todd Internado is going to value you already, man. Um, you know, if you're somebody who is trying to develop velocity and you love data and you love, you know, learning value to me before you even step on campus because you're what we look for, you're what we teach. Um, you know, so I think, you know, matching that up is very important, man. And the accolades of a 13-year-old, you know, the rings you get from winning the USSA at 13 years old have nothing to do with you becoming a college athlete, a good college athlete, or getting a scholarship, and have nothing to do with that. Yeah, and, and like you said, I, I really like what you said, and, and this is why we got we started this, you know, outside the lab thing here is is every every coach is different. Every program is different. You know, I may like a runner. You may like a banger. You know, I may like a guy that pitches a little bit. You may like only velo guys, you know, uh, what, whatever it is. Um, and, and the mixture's got to be right academically, 
uh, socially, all that kind of stuff. Because, you know, and a big part of things, baseball takes up a huge part of your time in college. But, you know, you do have academic. Uh, it's not going to be awkward. I mean, I lost it there a little bit. Yeah, I just said the baseball part of it is just a small part of it. You know, obviously we do a lot of it on campus uh, when you get to college, but, you know, uh, there, there's academics that are obviously very important, and, and socially you can't go somewhere that can't be too awkward for you. Yep, absolutely, man. I, you know, if you're not comfortable – I stole this from Todd and Donato. Um, you know, if you're not comfortable where you're playing or who you're playing for – it's going to be like the time you came home, you knew you got in trouble, both your parents knew you got in trouble, you're pulling up into the driveway, and it's that awkward feeling of walking in the door knowing I messed up, my parents know I messed up, and this is not going to be good. You know, that's what it's going to feel like walking down to the field every single day, and that, that's a recipe for disaster as far as your college experience goes and as far as your development goes. I mean, I could have the best game plan in the world – to develop you as a pitcher, whether it's pitchability, velocity, your body, um, health-wise, arm care, whatever you want to say, man. I could have the best plan in the world, dude. But if you're not happy where you're at and you're not at least at peace with the stuff off the field socially, the, the town you're in, all that stuff, you know, I'm not saying you got to love it, but, but you can't hate it, dude. You're setting yourself up to kill your development. You're going to murder it, dude. I mean, it, you know, it's like going to the gym and lifting every day. I love to lift. It's like going in there every day and being around people that you don't like. Like your development's just going to be crap. You know, you're not going to do it. You're not, you can think you're going to use that as motivation, but the chances are you're probably not. Yeah. That's only going to last so long, man. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. That's right. Well, man, Hey, uh, before we wind up, man, I want to give you uh, maybe a, a 30 seconds, a minute, whatever, um, kind of wrap up any final thoughts on all this, but we appreciate you coming on, man. And, and, and taking your time, uh, during this and, and look forward to you uh, getting up and seeing us up here at Athletes Lab and, 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 and us bringing some of our guys down there, um, you know, to, to kind of see campus and, and all that kind of stuff when all this stuff gets out, man. So uh, thanks for being on. And, and, and what you got, a little final wrap-up, last 30 seconds, 15 seconds or so. Yeah, absolutely, man. First, first off, I appreciate you having me on. And, you know, would love to come up there and check out the new facility and, you know, love to have you guys down on campus, man. I mean, you know, groups come down all the time and watch us practice and, um, you know, I tour them around campus and things like that. And it's uh, it's really, really cool for them to get to see, you know, who we are, what we do and what Lambda University looks like, man. Um, you know, the, the final wrap up that I would say, and, I, you know, I've already said it once in this, man, is, you know, if you're a high school kid watching this, I don't care if you're 15 years old or you're a senior and you're 17, 18 years old. Um, you know, understand what you're doing and take ownership in what you're doing. Um, you know, the, the throwing program that I give our pitchers is their throwing program, not mine. Um, you know, they need to own that and they need to understand that it's, it's, it's theirs, man. I'm the bumpers on the bowling alley keeping you in the middle, man. I'm not, it's not in stone. This is exactly what you have to do because every person is different. Every human being is different. And, you know, the three steps to me for development are very, very clear, man. Um, you know, what to do, why you need to do it. Understanding the why to me is super important um, because I think the buy-in comes from understanding the why and then how to do it, you know, figure out how to do it. So, I mean, if you're a guy and you're working on your body, you know, start getting a plan for what you're going to do to work on your body. Um, understand why you needed to do that and then, and then get the how. Um, you know, I think that's very, very important. Everybody, Jason Burke, uh, great program, great friend, great pitching coach, great coach in general, man. Thanks for uh, stopping by. Remy, I really appreciate it, man. Looking forward to seeing you soon, and I hope you guys stay safe during all this. Thank you. See you, Remy.